Good morning. Good morning. So I sent a presentation. Hopefully, you just I just got it. You just got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Does that mean we should have hard copies of? Uh, is it a PowerPoint? It, it is, but it's not necessary. I can sort of walk through it. It'll provide. Do you have copies? I don't have copies. Okay. I'm if sorry. If you give them too many pictures, they focus on the pictures. <laughs> they don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> it's mostly just trying to, to pull all of these pieces together. So I apologize. You will send it to the copy room. We'll, have, we'll catch up. Okay. okay. Paper copies so that people don't have to take notes like that. But Perfect. Meanwhile, as yes. presenter on Roger's suggestion, okay. <laughs> close, full attention. I got it. Um, so my hope is to, to do some, some stage setting for you this morning and then turn it over to folks with the, the particularized expertise. I um, can start by talking a little bit about just nutrient pollution in Vermont's major watersheds, the Lake Champlain, the Lake Nampanagot, and the Connecticut River watersheds, um, the approach we're taking to uh, identifying and projects and then funding those projects, and then Emily can speak to the accomplishments, uh, which is really what's reflected in the Clean Water Performance Report. Um, about 11 o'clock, we'll be joined by folks, uh, Hannah Smith, who's the attorney for the wetlands program, and Patrick Munts from the stormwater program, and can take up those, those specific detailed topics, which are certainly part and parcel of the larger clean water work. Um, we do have existing TMDLs, or pollution budgets, for both Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog related to phosphorus. Um, both of them require, in some ways, a, a similar level of reduction, about a third from the, the current condition. Um, similar also between those two watersheds is that wet weather really is driving the pollution in both cases. Um, there's a very limited contribution from wastewater treatment facilities, but the vast majority, over 90% in both watersheds, um, is, is being driven by runoff-based processes, runoff from developed lands, from roads, from agricultural fields, from forestry operations. So, Part of the challenge we fundamentally face is, as, as a result of cl changing climate, we're seeing increasing amounts of precipitation. We're seeing an increasing number of intense storms. And as a result, we see an increase in the phosphorus load. Um, the phosphorus load is, it correlates pretty directly with the amount of runoff um, that we're seeing, which correlates pretty directly with the amount of rainfall. Can I check in on this inside? No, the scale yeah. thing. So, my, the, what I think I've heard is that Vermont, on an average year, gets something like 35 inches of rain. Mm -hmm. And that in the last, I don't know how long, 20 years, 50 years, we it's gone up nine inches. Does that sound about right? So, the, there, there is a graphic actually in the Clean Water Performance Report that speaks to this. We have a trend line that goes back to the 1940s up through 2020. So, that's an 80 year record. Um, back in the 1940s, and this is at the Burlington Airport, we were looking at just over 30 inches of rain a year, and now we're up in the 37 to 38 range. <laughs> there is a considerable variability within the state. Um, the sort of the Champlain Valley, this is probably fairly representative of as you get out into the, the spine of the greens. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, JP currently sees over 45 inches of rain a year. So there's already a, a much more significant, there's, there's an oreographic effect in addition to this climate change effect that probably is amplified well, as right, you move up into the green. Yeah, and I would say that we've always gotten more water than Correct. they have, so it would be on a on a relative scale. Yeah, absolutely. But just to keep in mind that this is really, the, the data that's presented in the report is for Burlington Airport and probably mm -hmm. most reflective of the Champlain Valley. And then more intense storms. And then even more problematically still, more intense storms that tend to come in the spring and the Correct. fall that don't have crops on. Correct, shoulder, shoulder season conditions. Um, we also don't want to make that excuse also all the time also that, you know, it's, I mean, these are things that we've got to get ready and deal with, I think. Uh, absolutely. You know, I, I, I don't want it too much out there that, you know, this is not that you're coming from me, but that, you know, it's intense storms, what are we going to do, what was us? I think we've got to really start to, to recognize this and deal with it. I agree. I, yeah. yeah, I think there's a, there's a new normal, um, but some of it is being aware of the fact that the, where I guess where those key differences yeah. are between sort of historic conditions and rainfall patterns yeah. and what we're seeing on, under our climate change regime. It's not children months. 
Someone mentioned shoulder months. It's not shoulder months. So I, I, I'll send you a link to a presentation, Senator. We had uh, Leslie Ann Dupuy Giro, who's the state climatologist, come and present um, at the municipal day that ANR runs every year. And she, she had Vermont-specific data that indicated that a piece of it is that we are, it is wetter in the spring and the fall, and we're actually seeing more drought-like conditions in the summer. Always has been, but the storms that, 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 that strip the fluvial, uh, that's summertime. Right? Oh, oh, that's when the big damage is done. So yeah. one point that you made was that municipal uh, septic is, is a small part of it. Does that mean <coughs> just the point source, or does that mean when they overflow as well? Uh, so what's represented in when you see our sort of typical pie charts that show the load, that's generally the wastewater treatment plant um, effluent, the treated effluent. Mm -hmm. That said, um, CSOs are actually even a tiny fraction of that small wedge of the even pie. Even with the overflow. Okay. Co okay. Correct. Um, generally. Not that it's good. No, no. And, they, and to be clear, there are real human health concerns yes, associated absolutely. with sewer overflows. They are not a significant source of phosphorus. Okay. Um, you know, I know. Right. This, is, this is great. <laughs> um, so I talked about the, the idea that it's really weather is, is the primary driver of, of nutrient pollution. Um, the other challenge associated with weather is that it's noisy from year to year, which makes it really hard to, to detect trends, particularly in the short term. Um, we are the beneficiaries of some particularly robust data sets um, for Lake Champlain, where we have data that now stretches back the better part of 30 years, and we are able to look at those long-term trends. Um, currently, many of those trends are still ticking, ticking upward, and part of the challenge is rainfall is also ticked upward during that period, and so it, it can be hard to um, make sure that the work we're doing is having the desired effect on the ground using only these long-term monitoring programs um, at the mouths of the major tributaries and in the lake segments. There is a body of work that's being done by the Lake Champlain Basin Program to, to try to control for the effects of weather, and it does show um, more improvement than you would see by looking at the raw data, but certainly not the kind of improvement we ultimately want to achieve. Um, so just in terms of what needs to happen, we need to achieve a 34% reduction in phosphorus loading in Lake Champlain, a 29% reduction in loading to Lake Manfromagog, and we're looking at about a 50% reduction in nitrogen loading um, to the Connecticut River and Long Island Sound, although that pollution budget is still under development. EPA is leading the work on that because it's not just uh, Vermont and New Hampshire, but also implicates Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York all um, have significant contributions to Long Island Sound. For perspective, uh, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL requires a 24% reduction in phosphorus. The Gulf of Mexico requires a 20% reduction in nitrogen, and Lake Erie requires a 40% reduction in phosphorus. So we're, we're within the bounds of reason. Um, are, those, are, mass, are those all EPA set, or are those states individually working kind of on their own? I'm just curious, is this something where the EPA is coming into Lake Erie, and, um, or is it yes. coming in? It no, is, they, it? All, every one of those has multiple states, um, and so by virtue of the fact that it's a, a multi-state watershed, yeah. uh, EPA, EPA has a heavy involvement. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So you could just say that Chesapeake's 24 percent, mm -hmm. it is, and Lake Champlain's 34. Correct. Right. Okay. So that's like a bit of a sober statistic when I think of the Chesapeake, where I've seen, um, I thought it was that they were doing a lot worse than Lake Champlain because they had a lot more people, a lot more impacts, a lot more people upstream. We had heard, didn't we, last year that Chesapeake was making a lot of progress pretty quickly. They, they, well, after 20 years of not making much progress right, at right, all. Right, 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 right. 20 year old success. Yeah, right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so they're, they're, the Chesapeake is challenging from the number of political jurisdictions involved, frankly, from the size and scale of the watershed and how far removed. Um, many people who live in sure. the Chesapeake Bay watershed, I mean, you could live up in Cooperstown, New York, and be in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Is that right? Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, right. But so, so your people were very far removed from where the, the impacts are felt. Um, and that can be a challenge as well. 
but they, they are they are at this point making wow. significant progress and, and we are in routine communication with colleagues down there too with an effort to, to make sure we're learning from them to the extent possible um, the way we're going to to achieve those reductions is a combination of voluntary and mandatory programs the mandatory programs were largely laid out in act 64 of 2015 and include the required agricultural practices, um, stormwater permitting programs, including the three acre permit we'll talk about a little bit later on, and the municipal roads general permit, mandatory upgrades for wastewater treatment facilities um, that were by and large required by EPA um, because that's one of the, the few levers they have in this work and wanted to feel like that helps sort of them hold our feet to the fire, um, and then changes to the accepted management practices for forestry. He's the, he's the good looking one over here. <laughs> last, last session you passed Act 76, uh, which speaks largely to the um, non-regulatory programs and natural resources restoration work in particular. Um, we have some significant efforts underway in terms of wetlands restoration with additional funding that um, Senator Leahy has been able to secure to support that work, as well as floodplain reconnection and river corridor protection projects. Um, really, the, the work under Act 76 is deal, about a third of the phosphorus pollution reduction we need to achieve is expected to come through these voluntary programs, two-thirds through our regulatory programs. So the work um, the General Assembly did last session relative to Act 76 is really focused on that third of the reductions we're expected to come from these, these above and beyond projects. Um, there's a mix of funding that's also implicated here. So as, as I know you know, we're, we're spending on the order of 50 to $60 million a year. Um, currently, a, about a third of that comes from the Clean Water Fund, um, and that percentage will tick up in FY21. Um, but we're relying on, there's a, a surcharge on the property transfer tax. The unclaimed bottle deposits have started to be remitted to the Clean Water Fund as of, of October uh, 1st of last year. Um, there's four points of the rooms and meals tax in the current fiscal year that's dedicated to clean water, and there will be six points starting in FY21. Um, and all told, that reaches about $15 million in the Clean Water Fund for FY20. Uh, we also continue to see significant funding from the capital bill. Uh, as you may recall, in FY 18 and 19, we had a really huge increase in cap our capital bill allocation at the recommendation of the treasurer. Um, that it was about $25 million a year for each of those two years. We, we've dropped back to, to a, what we hope is a more sustainable level um, and is commiserate with, with historic investments of the capital bill in the order of 10 to $12 million a year in FY 20. Um, we are at 12.1. And then there are some other appropriations that uh, go into clean water work but wouldn't be under the purview of the Clean Water Board, including allocations through the transportation bill for work along the state's roads and highways. Um, and then the appropriations bill, um, there's both the, the SRF match, which is uh, the fund we use to make loans to municipalities for, for wastewater improvement projects as well as money for the Farm Agronomic Practices Program at the Ag Agency. And last year, uh, we received $6.1 million from Senator Leahy um, specifically to support implementation of the TMDL through the Lake Champlain Basin Program. And this year, we're anticipating almost $6.4 million in that same federal account. So again, continued robust federal support for the work we're doing. Um, you may have heard of the, about the auditor's report last year, just to, to reflect that, that there was some simplification in, in the way he considered how flexible all of those dollars are. So to the extent we have about $50 million um, dedicated to clean water, more than half of those are, are what I would call directed. Um, so the investments are real, they're just not discretionary. Uh, they are either, they have strings that say they must be spent on municipal wastewater, stormwater, and CSOs. They're required to be invested in transportation related projects, or they're subject to the Lake Champlain Basin Program's approval process and not governed by the state. Um, so I guess the last point I would make is, is I do believe that this is truly a 20 year proposition, that this is one, once, once all is said and done, gonna be one of the most significant engineering undertakings the, the state has, has engaged in. Um, the early years, which were, were sort of in that transition period, really have been characterized by planning and putting systems in place. 
um, and we believe we're, we're about to, to see a dramatic uh, acceleration in the implementation phase. And I think it's just always important to keep in mind that progress won't come in neat increments of a pound of phosphorus per certain dollars invested. Um, and that our progress is going to be complicated by, by climate change as rainfall and rainfall intensity continue to increase, um, but that we, we think we are on the, the path to achieving our shared clean water goals. And with that, I would propose to turn it over to Emily, who can talk about some of the more specific um, information we've compiled as part of the performance report, unless you have other questions for me. I'd like to ask one quick question. Just a, sort of a lay question in a way. It, will Otter Creek always run muddy? I mean, it's just always a big brown plume. Yeah, and it's sort of year in and year out. And I think some of the, um, I would need to get back to you on specifics of that. I, I think that the, it, it's a slow winder is how we would describe that kind of stream. It's low gradient. Um, and I think some the turbidity is some of that turbidity is, is naturally occurring. Um, I think you ideally we will all hope to see a reduction in the degree of turbidity, but I'm not sure it would ever run clear. Um, but I can uh, check with staff that would would be able to answer that question with a lot more certainty well, it's just than one I of those think. things. You know, we do all this. We're all doing work, uh, and people are happy about that. But when you look at our creek, you know. Uh, Lake when you you just see brown water flowing out this big plume into the lake and it's been that way for quite a while. And Don't you remember the song? Oh, black water. <laughs> some of them are on my yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, let, let me get um, some additional information and get get back to you on that. Because it's going to have a lot to do with what soils they run through on their way there. And, it it yeah. does, and the, the fine clay soils tend to stay in suspension for mm -hmm. a very long time. Yeah. Um, there's some amount of erosion that's a natural process. You know, one of the, there was a, a gentleman who I had heard speak from the um, USDA Agricultural Research Service, and what he had said is erosion is a natural process. What's unnatural is the rate at which it's occurring currently. Um, and so just sort of keeping that in the back of my mind all the time, too. And it's not dissimilar to the TM deals, where the goal for phosphorus isn't zero. Right? Like there's some amount of transport and movement that just takes place naturally. We just have too much. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, I will get you an answer to that question, okay. Senator. Thank you. Yeah. Let me ask you another question. <clears throat> when we had a presentation uh, you know, in the governor's address, he mentioned a certain amount being reduced of phosphorus. Yeah. How is that? Can you just tell how that's being measured? How so uh, that's exactly that's what Emily's presentation will okay. be. Right. And then I have one more quick, times. easy question. I think. <laughs> Who are you going to vote for in the primary? <laughs> oh, <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> I take it. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, I do have some presentation slides that I will hand out as well as a fact sheet, and right. I understand you all have copies of the report in front of you. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of saving paper, I did put two slides, but all of these graphics are noted page numbers in the report if you want to see Perfect. it in a little bit more detail. Thank you. Do you mind if I pass that no, to you? No, not at all. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So long. This one. Thank you. This is important. Yes. This is um, stronger and stronger. A lot. Uh, oh, thank you. Very helpful. Data. And yeah, there's right. a lot of happening with it. So thank you. Well, it's an ever-growing challenge to capture all the great work that's happening across the landscape for clean water. So we enjoy the challenge the of putting it together every year. <laughs> uh, so thank you again for having me. I'm Emily Bird, Clean Water Initiative Program Manager at the Department of Environmental Conservation. My program oversees <coughs> tracking, accounting, and reporting related to clean water. We work very closely across state government. And new this year, we're also working very closely with the US Department of Agriculture, Natural Resource Conservation Service, and the Lake Champlain Basin Program to start to integrate the results of federal funding more so into this report. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through the report today to give you a sense of what is included in the report. And I also want to make sure we have plenty of time to introduce you to a whole new section of the report called Part 2. That is our Lake Champlain TMDL progress report. It fulfills the reporting requirements to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency within the Lake Champlain total maximum daily load. Uh, so we've designed this report 
to fulfill multiple reporting requirements from an efficiency standpoint. Uh, so the report's in front of you. Uh, the first page here, uh, slides one and two, are really just introductory. Uh, before moving on to slide number three, uh, before we get into the details, I usually just set the stage describing what a clean water project is because we use that term quite a bit throughout the report, as well as the total maximum daily load. Uh, Secretary Moore already gave a great primer to this, uh, but just a refresher. We're funding, the state of Vermont is funding and supporting clean water projects all across different land uses. <coughs> and it's really necessary when you're dealing with non-point source pollution uh, for it to be an all-in approach, targeting all these different land sources of phosphorus and other nutrients and sediment, uh, because most of our pollution is from rainfall-driven and snowmelt-driven events. Uh, so uh, we're working through agricultural lands, developed lands, targeting stormwater runoff from hard surfaces like roof runoff and parking lots, as well as roads uh, and wastewater treatment. And all of these projects have a benefit of reducing nutrients and sediment, uh, whether it's nitrogen or phosphorus or sediment from erosion, uh, but they also bring a number of co-benefits that are very beneficial to the state of Vermont, uh, including flood resiliency, habitat restoration, enhancing our recreational assets, and supporting the working landscape. Uh, so there are a number of benefits and we're striving to capture all of those benefits in our data that we're tracking each year. A total Can I ask a quick sure. question? Do you track um, employment that flows from all this work? We have not begun to track that yet. Uh, I There could possibly be some... Employment. 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 Oh, yeah. There exactly. could possibly be some data sources available that may be of interest. Um, do you know? I don't, and not that no, I mean, that we, it was something we had talked about um, and, and talked about briefly with the D Department of Labor, because we know that these significant investments are translating to a body of work in the engineering community, in the nonprofit community, and in the contractor community, mm -hmm. um, but, but haven't, haven't figured out exactly how to pull all of those, those pieces I mean, together. My guess is, you know, we're over 20 years, we're spending a trillion plus dollars. Uh, One billion. Billion. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm not saying that. It's expensive, but not that expensive. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, billion. Think about it. Like Budget director Bray. Well, <laughs> so a gazillion dollars. <laughs> and uh, no, it might honestly, it might be sort of the, the largest infrastructure program the state's ever taken on. So. Uh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Rather than thinking about it, it's just a burden. I also. It may well be that it's something we're doing for ourselves that provides good employment for many people. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and we, we've talked about it qualitatively, but haven't done that more quantitatively. So we'd rather have you do this, <laughs> I think. You, you spoke about the numerous weather events causing erosion, and um, I don't, you can't talk about the numerous weather events causing erosion if we don't say that at the same time we have numerous agricultural practices and road building practices which um, together with those rain events mm -hmm. cause erosion and it's a you got to deal with both of those things and you can't attribute to you can't attribute it to one or the other it's both absolutely and we are finding especially uh, municipal roads is a great example once a road section is brought up to the municipal road general permit standards it is much more resilient to these severe storm events compared to before and so municipalities are finding that adapting these types of practices increases their maintenance cost because it's making their road networks more resilient. Trying to um, undo the practices that for 20 years absolutely. or 30 years were actively championed and paid for. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we were big challenge. For years to get road water downhill faster and now we are but the stepping next back and, and trying to get water downhill more well, slowly. Mm -hmm. the, but the next challenge is going to be, I've heard uh, we've got an especially problematic steep hill in our town that the the stone line ditches have already filled up mm -hmm. with sediment and yes it's doing its job but it's an extremely expensive project if you have to redo it every 
few years. Absolutely. And so I think, you know, I think in the future there's going to need to be technology invented so you can mm -hmm. dig the stone out and separate the sediment out so that you're not just dumping all that stone you spent huge money on as fill somewhere and having to buy new mm -hmm. riprap again. It's Absolutely. a very expensive process. Absolutely. for Great. Uh, and throughout the presentation, I'll also be referring to a total maximum daily load, or TMDL. Most of the state of Vermont is covered by these large-scale nutrient TMDLs that are federally required when a water body no longer meets water quality standards. Uh, for Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog, we're really targeting phosphorus reductions in order for those water bodies to meet state of Vermont water quality standards. And as Secretary Moore mentioned, we're also part of a five-state watershed that drains to Long Island Sound through the Connecticut River, and there's going to be work needed under that section of the state, uh, both from wastewater optimization for nitrogen treatment, which is underway, as well as the non-point and stormwater sources that we've been working so hard to address, which we're playing them for making as well. So there is not yet, is it correct, a, uh, Long Island Sound TMDL? There is a Long Island Sound TMDL, and it was published in 2001, written by the state of Connecticut and New York together. And that, uh, that TMDL primarily targets reductions from the Connecticut and New York sources being the primary sources. Uh, however, it does include parts of Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Uh, and requires about a 10% reduction from non-point sources, uh, but then a more substantial reduction from the point sources, so the wastewater treatment facilities that discharge directly into the Connecticut River and its tributaries. Do we not have a Connecticut River TMDL then? And what am I, I thought we did, we're missing a piece, but we know it's coming and we're already we, we are missing a Vermont-specific allocation of the load, and uh, EPA is working on a study that will help to better apportion the load reductions for nitrogen in the Long Island Sound watershed regionally, uh, looking at the embayments of Long Island Sound directly, but also better understanding the sources in the upper basin states like Vermont. So, we, so we're already taking steps, even if we don't have a mm -hmm. firm figure in mind for what our target ultimately will be. We anticipate it will be coming, and all of the work that we're doing related to Act 64 and Act 76 are really preparing us to be well positioned to say, yes, we are already doing a substantial amount of work that will benefit Long Island Sound, and we're tracking it too. So we have data about the extent of projects that are being implemented in that part of the state that we'd be able to share with the other states to demonstrate how we're doing our part and where we may need to do more. Thank you. So moving on to slide five here, uh, this is found in page nine of the report as well, an overview of the types of measures that are included in the report. The first measure, uh, really focusing on the state of Vermont investments in clean water, uh, is those investment measures describing how much the state has invested in clean water projects. Uh, it summarizes it by agency, by land use sector, geographic distribution. There's many different ways that it's presented. Uh, we also not only present on the level of investment, the number of projects funded, but the results of those investments in our project outputs and phosphorus reduction estimates. That's also summarized in part one of the report specifically for the state of Vermont investments. Part two of the report really broadens the scope to include federal funding programs and regulatory programs as well. Also understanding the need to do education outreach and technical assistance. We've been tracking the extent of the state of Vermont's outreach efforts related to clean water, as well as technical assistance efforts underway by various state of Vermont agencies and our partners. Uh, the goal of all of this education and outreach is really to better prepare the local partners out on the landscape, like municipalities or watershed organizations, farmers, to give them the right tools to be able to do this work and understand some of the resources, financial or technical, that may be available to help them. Ms. Bird, may I ask a quick question? I remember when Senator Pearson was in this committee, we talked about the possibility of, and this may have already happened, signage and notification, mm -hmm. letting people know their tax dollars are at work. This is a problem. Is that kind of thing happening? Are we like, yes. up in 
Uh, a County couple of years ago, we uh, purchased Clean Water Project signs Great. that are posted while projects are under construction if the project is visible publicly. Okay. Uh, so, for example, a stormwater treatment practice at an elementary school, you'd see a Clean Water Project sign posted. Yeah. So those have been dispersed to the various state agencies that fund this work. Thank you. I think that helps. Great. Yeah. And we also, I'll get to it in a little bit, we have an online Project Explorer, which is like a dashboard mm -hmm. that make all of the data that are summarized in this report available to the public as well. So there's quite a bit of tools that we've been working to develop to better get the Thank word you. out. Thank you. Okay, moving on to slide six. I already mentioned that this report now has two parts. The first part is the investment report that you've been familiar with over the last few years. Uh, the investment report summarizes state investments in clean water, the results of the state investment specifically, understanding that it is a bit of a Venn diagram and that these state investments may also leverage federal investments and these investments may also support regulatory compliance. So there is overlap in these various areas of reporting. Uh, so part one really focuses on those state investments and fulfills the investment reporting requirement. I'll just walk you through a few examples of some measures in the report related to the investment. Uh, on slide seven here, this is from the executive summary. You can see the four major basins of the state, Champlain, Memphremagog, Connecticut River, and the Hudson. And here we have summarized investments over the last four state fiscal years by land use sector. So you can see how the investments vary geographically depending on the types of projects that are being targeted. Uh, for example, in the Hudson River section, a large wastewater treatment facility upgrade uh, that is really showing quite a major investment in wastewater is because these are more expensive infrastructure projects compared to, say, an agricultural field practice. Uh, slide. Yeah. Oh, uh, just saying, showing how in. The executive summary, we show the investments by the four major basins by land use sector. And so you can see here in the Hudson River that there is a major investment in wastewater due to a, an expensive wastewater treatment improvement that was made. Um, like and, cement and rebar and yeah. building. Yeah, it's building. more of the more traditional of infrastructure plate. through a Clean Water State Revolving Fund loan, which ultimately municipalities will, will repay uh, but you can see the, the relative distribution of the different types of investments in different parts of the states, depending on what sources are being targeted. So we were, were talking about something about land use practices. Or... Yeah, so I was just making the point that uh, while at the wastewater treatment facility expense may be high, uh, there's still a lot of work happening in those other land uses, like agricultural practices are being implemented, but they're lower cost. So it's showing as a smaller proportion of the cost in that part of the state. Mr. Chair, what's the body that makes a decision between whether to spend it downstream on some and rebar or upstream on agricultural practices? Is that the regional? Regional? Mission I, I didn't think it was stab at it, but I think I'll ask the agency to respond. Yep. Uh, so we use tactical basin planning. It's uh, a <coughs> an approach that covers each of the 15 river basins in the state of Vermont. Tactical basin planning is done on a five-year rotating cycle, and it's really a local approach identifying water quality concerns in each of the river basins. So exam for example, the Winooski, the Otter Creek, the Batten Kill, uh, each have their own basin plan. And it, they use the results of modeling sector-based assessments like a, a municipal road erosion inventory, for example, to really better identify where there are pollutant loading hotspots on the landscape and where to target projects to address those issues. And it's all integrated together in this one report of the basin plan itself that is really sort of the roadmap for the local groups in that watershed to better target where they're investing these dollars to achieve water quality results. That's by a vote of the people in the area. There is, there is participation in the process by the regional planning commissions, the natural resource conservation districts, and they also hold uh, a number of public meetings to provide uh, local input in the process. 
but eventually they vote on what they would recommend? I'm not sure that there is a formal voting process, but it is certainly collaborative. And for the total amount of funding, and that's all those, um, I was thinking of the tactical basin plans is creating our giant project list, right, the mm -hmm. pipeline. And then uh, is it the Clean Water Board that in the end then allocates money between I don't, I don't know how you decide to, which tactical base plan gets how much effort. But maybe you can say something about how those decisions are made. Sure. Uh, so the Clean Water Board provides a recommendation of how much funding is going to be invested in, say, agriculture compared to natural resource restoration. And that's done at the pretty high level statewide on an annual basis. However, with Act 76 that just passed last legislative session, we're moving into the fiscal year 22 budget process and then we will start to be allocating funding to those new budget categories. And one of those is the water quality restoration formula grants where dollars will be allocated to the tactical basin planning watersheds we mentioned before uh, based on a phosphorus reduction target. So that will be a new approach where we're actually allocating funding based on different watersheds and the results that are needed in each of those watersheds. Uh, so that's going to be a big leap forward in how these funds are dispersed and we'll get um, more into the geographic dispersal of funding. Is there anything you want to add to that? No, that was perfect. Great, thank you. Okay, so moving on through the report, uh, sharing some examples of the measures that are reported here. Uh, slide eight shows the investment from state fiscal year 2016 through 2019 by land use sector. Uh, you can see in dark gray, those are the municipal wastewater loans through the Clean Water State Revolving Fund that will ultimately be repaid back to the state and be used for more projects moving forward. Uh, I will point out there is a slight dip from state fiscal year 18 to 19, and that is not the result of there being less uh, funding appropriated. It was the result of a spike in uh, investments through the municipal pollution control grants and the Clean Water State Revolving Fund in state fiscal year 18. Uh, these, pro these dollars are allocated to these larger infrastructure projects uh, based on their construction schedules. And it happened that in this year, there was just a lot of projects aligning at the same time. So it, it isn't so much a dip, but a spike in state fiscal year 2018. And as Secretary Moore had described, uh, the appropriations to clean water have been growing over the last few years, and we expect that to continue to be reflected in these data moving forward. Uh, on to slide nine. Here is an example of those outreach data that I had mentioned earlier. We've been working across state government since 2015 to track the extent of outreach that's being done by state of Vermont agencies related to clean water. And this shows how the level of outreach and education has continued to increase each year. Uh, remarkably, in state fiscal year 2019, there was quite a large increase. And agencies are doing this outreach directly, but also funding grants and contracts to partners like University of Vermont Extension or the conservation districts to also do some of this outreach themselves. So we're gathering all those data. So we're able to report back on the extent of those efforts. Uh, there's also a number of technical assistance measures in the report that you can look into. Things like uh, workshops with the municipal roads general permit uh, to really show how uh, to really show how uh, we're providing support to the key partners in getting this work done. Slide 10. Can I have a quick question? Sure. Uh, Agricultural associations, uh, which took a big jump in 2019, mm -hmm. is that things like the Lake Champlain uh, Farmers Alliance, or who are the agricultural associations? Uh, that would be groups, oh, well, University of Vermont Extension, you can see in gray, is also substantial, but I believe that this is Agency of Agriculture has been funding grants to agricultural associations to do outreach and educational efforts to support farmers. And so I believe that's largely what that um, section of the bar chart is related to. So, uh, Mr. Patch, so is that like the Lake Champlain Farmers Coalition, that kind of uh, the coalitions on the north and south lake? Yeah, Ryan Patch, Lakes and Agriculture Food Markets. 
Um, yeah, yes, you're correct. Uh, Champlain Valley Farmers Coalition, Farmers Watershed Alliance, Connecticut River Waters and Farmers Alliance, Vermont Grass Farmers Association, Vermont Veggie and Berry Growers Association. Um, a lot of those folks are working on water quality outreach and education with their members. Thank you. Yep. Okay, moving on to slide 10. Here is an example of a project outputs table. This is in the executive summary as well as in uh, the part one of the report. We've been tracking, we've standardized performance measures based on different project types. We've been tracking these data for four years now. Uh, so you can really see how these efforts are starting to ramp up. Uh, for example, acres tr of impervious surface like hard surfaces, rooftops, parking lots, roads, treatment of that has continued to increase each year, uh, as well as miles of municipal roads that are being improved for water quality. Uh, and as I mentioned, many of these projects also have very beneficial uh, results in terms of flood resiliency and uh, maintenance, reduced maintenance costs to the road networks. Next slide, uh, moving from the developed lands to the agricultural sector as an example. Um, slide 11 shows the estimated total phosphorus load reduction <coughs> related to agricultural practices that were funded by the state of Vermont, primarily through Agency of Agriculture. And we've developed a best management practice accounting tool uh, in our database that uses uh, the total, the Lake Champlain TMDL modeling and the annual performance of different practice types to estimate from a modeled standpoint the reductions that these projects are achieving at the practice level. Uh, so these are modeled estimates and each practice has its own lifespan. So for example, an annual practice like cover crop is going to achieve a phosphorus reduction for one year unless we have data showing that it's being implemented longer than that. Uh, and we, we take that approach to make the, the point that all of these investments require maintenance uh, and that practice lifespan is a very important component to the tracking. Uh, so what you can see in this bar chart is from state fiscal year 2016 to 19, the estimated phosphorus reductions associated with agricultural practices. And to the right of the gray dotted line in state fiscal year 20 and 21, those are projected based on the project lifespans. So it's really important that we continue to maintain this level of effort and build upon it each year in order to meet our goals for the Lake Champlain TMDL, as well as Lake Memphis Magog and other parts of the state. And again, this is just the results of state investments. I'm moving shortly into part two of the report, which really gets at the full scope of all of our tracking, including the federal funding and regulatory programs. The next slide, uh, slide 12 from page 44 of the report, gets to the cost effectiveness of these investments. Uh, so what I've done is taken the whole data set of everything that we're tracking and filtered it down to only those projects that have estimated phosphorus reductions. And looking at the estimated phosphorus reduction, the total cost reported to us, uh, as well as their lifespan, calculating the relative cost effectiveness of these projects in terms of phosphorus treatment. So uh, you can see here on the left hand side, the lowest cost per unit of phosphorus treated are those agricultural practices installed or applied on fields and pasture. Okay, can you repeat that again? Sure. So the, the, low, the, the lowest yes, cost yes. per unit of phosphorus reduced okay. is agricultural okay. practices on fields and pasture. So this does not include uh, the more structural fixes on a production area or barnyard, for so example. So in other words, that's the biggest bag for our buck. It certainly yes. is. Okay. Um, and but but I will add a caveat yeah. that yeah. lifespan is a very important consideration, mm -hmm. and these are practices that need to be continuously applied year okay. after year uh, in order to continue to perform. And so it's a, really the long-term investment and that new approach to how land is being managed is really important when we're talking about agricultural practices. The next most cost effective. And may I ask, so what kinds of practices are we talking about sure. in this case? Things like cover crop, okay. crop rotation. Okay, no till. Uh, yep, no till, uh, as well as riparian buffer restoration on okay. agricultural lands and some livestock exclusion from surface okay. waters. So again, these are things we just have to keep going and making certain people continue to practice. 
And uh, farmers are really stepping up. Um, I'll get to it in a, a little bit, but you can see that most of the reductions that we're so far able to quantify are from the agricultural sector, Terrific. with the caveat that we still have gaps in our ability to account for other practice types. So we're, we're expecting that as we fill in those gaps, it'll start to round out the picture nicely and show uh, substantial reductions in other sectors as well. Uh, so the next most cost effective are the, the restoration of riparian uh, forested areas on non-agricultural lands. Uh, and th these are box whisker charts, so they show the real range of the cost per unit because every project is different and have different site constraints that need to be dealt with. Uh, so really what you're seeing is the maximum, the minimum, and then the median uh, values on these charts. Uh, the next most cost effective are the road erosion practices that municipalities are implementing to bring their roads up to standards. Uh, these are relatively more expensive, but we believe it's primarily because a lot of these municipalities are targeting their trickiest road sections first, those steepest, most likely to erode road sections that are also more expensive to work on. Uh, and then next is the stormwater treatment practices. So stormwater treatment practices are engineered solutions. Uh, many of them are green stormwater infrastructure, so they still have that natural uh, benefit However, they are more expensive to implement. They're typically in developed areas, which are more expensive uh, with more site constraints. Uh, so you can see that those are relatively more expensive than the other project types. However, they have about 20 year lifespans or longer if they're properly maintained. So it's really important to take that all into consideration. And while these projects have varying degrees of cost effectiveness, they're all necessary in order for us to meet the Lake Champlain TMDL requirements. Uh, because reductions are required across all those different land use sources in order for us to be successful. Did you call this box, box whisker? Box whisker chart is the, the technical name. <laughs> I, I love it. I've never heard the whisker I've never part. heard of it. That's great. All right. Great. Thank you. It was a new one this year, so we're testing it out. It's great. <laughs> If I'm doing rough math and I look at the cost of the field practices at 200 bucks, and you multiply it by 20 years, it's $4,000. Mm -hmm. So it and is. You, and you look at the, uh, the, the sewage treatment plants, and it's. Uh, and the, sewer, the yeah. wastewater treatment facilities are not included on this. Uh, what I've only included those projects where we have cost and estimated phosphorus reductions at the project level from a data perspective that was the, really the only sound way to do that uh, because wastewater treatment facilities and things like barnyard production areas on farms we have investments that are made in specific elements of them uh, but we don't necessarily have cost in our data set associated with the whole site uh, so We're associating just to the fields Mm -hmm. and pastures costs to money invested in sewage treatment plants and mm -hmm. and then multi because they're yearly trying to multiply it by a large oh, number and, and, and this, then be able to compare them mm -hmm. in, a, in a more compatible mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and this does factor in lifespan in this chart here um, so if we were to add a wastewater treatment facility upgrade, it would likely be on the far right side. Uh, but wastewater treatment facilities are up against much more than just phosphorus. They're working on managing for bacteria, other pollutants, mitigating combined sewer overflows. Uh, so those investments are very necessary for more than just our phosphorus reduction goals. Um, and some of the investments we're making are the, the refurbishment of existing infrastructure which is really necessary in order to uh, avoid much more expensive fixes further down the road. Uh, so wastewater treatment facilities are a little bit more difficult to fit within this context because they, they do so much more than just treat for phosphorus. And we also don't, in all cases, have the cost specifically associated with their phosphorus treatment, which made it uh, limited our ability to integrate it into this graphic. But you, you bring up a really good point that the relative cost effectiveness, agriculture, natural resource restoration, those uh, municipal road fixes 
are very cost effective and uh, stormwater treatment can also be cost effective when it's maintained properly long term. Great. Thank you. Uh, moving on to slide 13. You can also flip to page 71 in the report. This is a watershed summary. Uh, this breaks down all of the data presented in the report that's statewide into those 15 river basins of the state. You can see on the top left, there's a small image of the state of Vermont and where this watershed is located with the political boundaries associated with it. So you can understand where you're at uh, in the landscape yeah. political, from a political boundary and a watershed boundary perspective. See how the state is investing in that part of the state on a more legal, local scale. Uh, and then we also have the performance measures, project results, and the estimated phosphorus reduction summarized here for each of those 15 river basins over the last four state fiscal years. Uh, so this has been a really helpful tool for our outreach, and I certainly encourage you to take a look at the watersheds that overlap with your districts. Uh, it could be a useful Great. resource when interacting with your constituents about what we're doing for clean water in different parts of the state. Uh, and then lastly, while we're on the investment side of things, uh, slide 14, we have the Clean Water Projects Explorer. This is a screenshot from our new online tool. There's also a fact sheet in your handouts here that gives you more information about how to access and use this tool. Uh, it is really making all of the data that are presented and summarized in this report available to the public and can be searched by the map function and also uh, search criteria on the left here. So that's part one of the report. <laughs> part two isn't as long, uh, but I will just give you a quick overview of what it contains. Uh, so we talked about part one that was all about state investments and the results of those investments. Part two broadens the scope to include data streams from federal funding programs like the Lake Champlain Basin Program, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is substantial, I believe it was about $22 million in the last federal fiscal year, uh, as well as some of those regulatory programs that are now starting to move into the implementation phase and we can gather data about the results of compliance with regulation. So in past years, one of the challenges was getting that data. And mm -hmm. you pretty much worked out the linkages so that you can have that information flow over to you. Uh, yes, we have worked out a process with the USDA where they are able to remove the personally identifiable information from the data set and be able to report to us each of the agricultural practices that they funded with enough data that we're able to quantify results. Uh, and there, there are still some data management challenges when you're working with such a, a, new, a large data set integrating it, uh, but I think we have come a really long way and it's been really nice to be able to include that uh, in our reporting this year. So we already talked quite a bit about the Lake Champlain TMDL and the reductions needed in order to achieve water quality standards in Lake Champlain, so I'm going to skip over slide 16 and move on to slide 17. Uh, earlier, I mentioned tactical basin planning and the 15 river basins in the state, how, it's, how it cycles through. Uh, this map here, also on page 46 of the report, in dark gray shows those basin boundaries. Uh, and the Lake Champlain TMDL has an accountability framework where EPA is going to be checking in with us to make sure that we're me making adequate progress implementing the Lake Champlain TMDL reductions. And so this year is the first year that we are up for a progress report card from EPA. Uh, it's going to be done on a cyclical process, so you can see in green the year that the basin plan was issued, in yellow the date or the year of the interim report card halfway through our planning cycle where EPA checks in, says, how are you doing? You should consider making these adjustments for the, the second half of this planning period. And then in orange, that's when they make their final report card for that planning cycle. So this year, the Lamoille and the Siskoi Basins are first up for those interim checkpoints. Uh, so we prepared this report to fulfill that reporting requirement. 
And there's two appendices in the report that specifically say, here are the strategies that we identified as necessary in the Lamoille and Missisquoi basins, and here's a status update on how those are doing. I won't get into all those details, but feel free to take a look at that. Um, but as I mentioned, moving on to slide 18, we're now uh, able to estimate phosphorus reductions for more than just state funding. Uh, so in orange, those are the estimated phosphorus reductions associated with federal funding programs. Green is state funding programs, and blue are the regulatory programs. So the federal funding is making a really big difference in uh, the work we're doing to clean up Lake Champlain now that we've been able to integrate the NRCS data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, it's, you can really see some measurable results there. And then moving on to... Yeah, quick question. Sure. Was, was there a budget announcement yesterday related to the water quality work? With uh, the oh. U.S. Department of I, I'm not familiar with that. Well, Senator McDonald, you, you may know more. You were asking. Yesterday, the federal government was announcing its budgetary outline mm -hmm. framework for federal budget. Mm -hmm. Yes. How did uh, whose budget? I, federal I, government. I, I, I can speak to that if you like. Um, so yesterday, uh, President Trump released his proposed federal fiscal 20 one, thank you, <laughs> budget. Um, it, it, in, it includes significant cuts um, to the Environmental Protection Agency budget as well as conservation programs, I believe, within the U.S. Department of Agriculture budget, um, not dissimilar to the budgets the President has proposed each of his first three years in office. Um, ultimately, that will go through the full legislative process, um, and, and while uh, clearly a uh, a statement of the, the president's policy priorities. The, the U.S. Congress has by and large restored, um, if not exceeded, sort of previous year funding requests for all the accounts that are most germane to this, this work. That's why I asked what budget. That's the well, uh, proposed budget. Proposed yeah. budget. Mm -hmm. um, and I have similar a question of similar pain, but maybe that's for the secretary before we adjourn. So. Okay, uh, so I'll just point out that now that we're integrating data streams from regulatory and federal funding programs, you can see that the reductions we're able to quantify are substantial. In the past, I think we were reporting back to you about 1.5 metric tons uh, just from the state funding, and this year, now there's a lot more work underway and more data available, and we're reporting 16.4 metric ton reduction estimated. Okay. And there are still gaps in our ability to estimate these reductions for all project types, uh, notably natural resource restoration projects, which we know are highly cost effective, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to, in the next couple of years, being able to integrate more of those results into this report. But if you move to the next slide, slide 19, you can see that most of those phosphorus estimates that we're able to uh, report back right now are from the agricultural sector, uh, partly because there's a lot of work happening in the agricultural sector. These projects are highly cost effective, and we still have some gaps in the, others, um, the other land use sectors, so we expect this will be rounded out a bit more. Uh, but it is substantial. It amounts to about 36,000 pounds of estimated phosphorus reduction across all these programs in state fiscal year 2019. Uh, and moving on to the next slide, slide 20, this is where we put it in the context of the TMDL. Uh, so the TMDL on the left, we have our baseline. That's an average of conditions from 2001 to 2010. So that's really our starting point. Then we show from state fiscal year 2016 through 2019 the estimated phosphorus reductions that we have uh, been able to estimate so far in those little white sections across the top. Uh, and the blue represents the required reduction that is ult the ultimate goal for 20 years from the beginning of this implementation time frame. Uh, so this amounts to about 7 or 8 percent of the required reduction needed uh, achieved in state fiscal year 2019. Uh, so we have a long way to go, uh, and these programs are still ramping up. Uh, we're just starting to move more into the implementation time frame on a lot of these programs, and we've been really focused on laying the programmatic 
groundwork for this in the last few years. So we do expect that this will ramp up in the coming years. Uh, but there's a lot of work to be done, and it is a 20-year proposition. And uh, so we will continue to track and use these data to help inform where we need to target our efforts more so. Um, so I just wanted to put it into context for you to understand. And there are still gaps in our ability to estimate phosphorus for all project types. So this is definitely an underestimation of the, the work that's happening. Uh, but it is also helpful to have these estimated reductions. Uh, we talked earlier about how weather can really cause a lot of noise and data trends. Uh, and this helps to provide sort of an incremental level of accountability at the project level for how we're doing while it's going to take time for those results to show up in our monitoring data. Sure. Seems like I remember from an earlier piece of work that you all did an S-shaped curve for uh, results over time. Yes. So if I look at the first four years and, and it, at 16, I'd say, oh, it's four, four times a year, but 20 times four is going to be 80 instead of 212, but that's as you predicted, right? I mean, that it's going to have a modest start, but as implementation accelerates, you'll see bigger gains. That is what we expect, and yes, like you said, Perfectly, it's not a linear pro process, so uh, we can't necessarily track this rate of implementation and phosphorus reductions through that 20-year time frame and know where we're going to land. Uh, we do expect that it will be ramping up, and I believe that Secretary it, it, Moore's it, it, materials it, it, has that it, exact graphic that you just mentioned. It, to be clear, this is a conceptual graphic, um, but there is a page towards the end of 20 something with no page, immediately I gave you a presentation with no page numbers, but it looks like this. Yeah. And what this looks at is, uh, these are the different regulatory programs that, that um, state government was tasked with under Act 64 and the deadlines for when they kick in. Um, and it shows that in the first few years it was a lot of programmatic work that was underway. Um, and we expect the phosphorus reductions to, to accelerate um, over the next few years. And I think we had, we had initially predicted a 10% reduction in the first four years. We've achieved somewhere between a 7 and an 8% reduction, mm -hmm. um, we believe, based on our conservative estimates. So it's you know not out of line with, with where we anticipated we would be with where we are in the overall project. Great. And I won't go into, oh, my apologies. No, my apologies. <laughs> May I? Yes, please. We're looking at this, this graph here. Uh, one of the questions that the chair often asks is, are we making progress? Is the lake, the lake itself getting cleaner? And if you look at this, it seems as though the answer is yes. yes. Well, of yeah. course, so we're going. We always say yes. But that is what, no, but, but to give credit, we're, you know, I, I think the secretary has been very honest in, and is, and, and points has, has level concern around whether or not we're making progress, but right now it looks as though we are making some progress. We are making progress. There are a lot of considerations beyond our direct control, so we can control funding and regulation to a certain extent. Uh, the report now has a whole section about external variables that affect our ability to meet the Lake Champlain TMDL, uh, precipitation, human population change, land use change, agricultural considerations, uh, and the actual monitored phosphorus load to Lake Champlain. Those are all summarized here in this report. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not sure <laughs> if you want me to get into those details, but I, I guess the, the short of it is it's complicated and there's a lot that we're up against, yes, yes, but all absolutely. of this work is certainly making a difference. Right. And adaptive management will be really important to check in and identify where uh, we're backsliding potentially things that are beyond our control and how we need to mitigate. But the population change is interesting because really the population growth in the state of Vermont really happened between Middle Area and St. Albans. Right. It's, mm -hmm. And that's all that Lake Champlain corridor. Mm -hmm. That's where everyone's moving into. Mm -hmm. Right, so you think, yeah, that's a factor. Well, it's so just an well. interesting factor yeah. as we're making progress on other fronts. Are we adding more pavement to, right. you know, other areas? And mm -hmm. More population is more waste and for regular citizens you know they're they're not necessarily that dialed into how much phosphorus are we reduce they wonder is the beach closed right. this summer exactly. how often of course those how things much are out of cyanobacteria was drawn and mm -hmm. that's related to but not 
entirely different on all this yellow. Absolutely. Did you say again? And there is a, a one pager in here that talks about how climate change is likely to affect cyanobacteria blooms, sure. making them more likely with the, the temperature considerations as well. Um, so it's much more comprehensive than in prior years, but uh, feel free to take a look at some of those details and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, well, thanks. I mean, I wish we could spend, we could, uh, we could spend a day really yeah. uh, going through this more detail. But it's, uh, thank you again for yeah, thank you both. every this year this very, very good. report gets more and more um, helpful in terms of thank really you. seeing how the work we're doing is you know, adding up. So thank, thank you, you very much. Um, my, my other question was um, the federal government has been rewriting rules on um, water quality, uh, um, air, pollution, um, air quality, stuff like that. And if the federal government were to rewrite the rules mm -hmm. for water quality and they survived the courts, and um, in the position we were in at that point was the same one we're in today, but suddenly we were now in compliance mm -hmm. because the, the grading criteria had changed and we're now have a passing grade. Mm -hmm. um, would What would be the fate of this Great project question. that the that the secretary and the administration and the legislature has endorsed. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to answer that? <laughs> sure, yes. Yeah. Uh, so the, the water quality standards are, are what guide our work in this space, and states are given primacy in setting their own water quality standards. Um, so the, the all of the, the goals that, that Emily's program is striving to achieve um, derive from, from the water quality standards established for, for Lake Champlain by the, um, by the state of Vermont. Uh, similarly, the Act 64, while we made a, a significant number of commitments to EPA um, as part of our TMDL implementation plan for Lake Champlain, um, the state went to, the, to the, the next step and codified those commitments in, in Act 64 of 2015. So again, if, if EPA um, pulled back from, from what they viewed as our obligations under the TMDL, we would still be um, obligated under state law to, to continue with implementation. Great question. But if we're obligated under the state law, then the Conservation Law Foundation would have to sue the state if we were not carrying out our own law. Would that be the case? Not being a lawyer, I'm going to go with, yes, I believe so. Which then empowers <laughs> the members of the legislature to say notwithstanding the law, mm -hmm. will take longer to do this. And as long as we have the feds there, we can't notwithstand their law. We are free to not achieve this. Well, the water quality standards that we're striving to meet for Lake Champlain are state of Vermont water quality standards. Uh, so ultimately, it is a state, uh, if the federal government were to change water quality standards, it wouldn't affect the ultimate goal for Lake Champlain. Uh, so I think I'll leave it at that. So we're, then we would be able to say, notwithstanding our current law, we're, we're you know, all the usual excuses you have for, for not moving forward on the path that you set for yourself would kick in. Like, you might treat that as a rhetorical <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so right. so You're an excellent witness. <laughs> Ex no, really, and very, both of you. This is very, very helpful. Thank you so much for yes. having yeah, us. Yeah, no, they learned a lot. <laughs> I don't know who was up next, but they've been. I think good. I need to come back. <laughs> okay. You're going to do a little more stage setting, and then we'll let you put questions to the next. So, yeah. Uh, Madam Secretary, so you have two other folks on your team. Ms. I do. Smith and Mr. Monks. Would you like me to introduce them? Well, sure. And we have 50 minutes left, so I'll figure that you'll you'll control the, the timing of things because you know how much each has to present. Right? Sure. So my thought was just to give a, a fairly high-level overview of both our work in related to the wetland statute and then our work related to the three-acre permit. And then essentially allow the committee as, as much time as remains to ask questions with the idea that, that Patrick and Hannah would take the lead in answering them. Great, thank you. Okay, so now you do have a copy of my presentation in front of you. Thank you, Jude. Um, and if you flip about two-thirds of the way into it, you'll see a slide that'll be blue that says wetlands. Uh, 
without page numbers? Yeah, I know. Sorry, oh, I really. Uh, no. like, you're already down to a <laughs> like a B minus. I know. <laughs> really, it's a hard. You create you create hard center projects. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, so just a little bit of context. Um, Vermont today is about four percent of Vermont's land area is covered is, is would be considered wetlands. Um, it's important to keep in mind the distribution of wetlands is not even throughout the state. Uh, as you will notice, it's sort of heavily biased towards the, the Champlain Valley and in particular Grand Isle, as, as you might expect. Um, from pre-settlement to 1980, which is when sort of modern wetlands regulations started to take effect, uh, Vermont is estimated to have lost about 35% of its wetlands area. So just to keep that in mind as context. Mm -hmm. um, wetlands provide a, a wide variety of important functions and values which Vermont's rules seek to protect. Uh, this is a, a, a little bit different um, than how the federal government looks at, at wetlands and maybe similar to the question you asked previously, Senator McDonald, about changes at the federal level. There's, there's work being done on the, the waters of the United States or the WOTUS rule um, that <coughs> doesn't have a lot of, of practical effect here in Vermont because we have uh, set our standards higher than the, the federal minimum requirements, which are being reduced somewhat. It has a greater impact in, in other states. For example, I have a colleague in Oklahoma, and she's indicated that their um, waters rules are tied explicitly to the federal requirements. So to the extent the federal government reduces uh, the level of protection being afforded to small streams and wetlands, um, their rules would, would step back as well. Uh, the, the way we identify wetlands is a combination of desktop work and then sending staff into the field to, to confirm our identification on foot. Um, there are three things we're looking at, hydric soils, and in the picture you can sort of see there's this mottled uh, gray and brown color, uh, hydrophilic or hydrophytic vegetation, which means wetland-loving vegetation, and then hydrology. Um, and so it, it does often require a field visit, particularly to identify the, the edges and the boundaries. Yes, and the question of ignorance. Dark home those nice light. Uh, can we, if we needed to, create wetlands? Or is it not that, you know, uh, for example, when you said that, you know, that we used to, we've lost 35%, it need be for different reasons. So I, is uh, that complicated? it's complicated. Sure, Certainly, sure. And, and I can get you some additional information on that. There are, there are opportunities for wetland restoration. Yes. Um, in places where we might have modified the hydrology, we can restore the hydrology, and oftentimes those wetlands will, will uh, sort of take care of, the rest will take care of themselves. Okay. Um, we've seen some particular success stories with marginal farmlands, um, particularly in the Otter Creek and Lemon Fair watersheds, where through a series of ditch plugs and, okay. and other strategies, um, you restore them. we've restored the, the wetlands. Thank There's also, much. we've had experience trying to create wetlands as offset okay. projects. Um, they haven't been particularly successful. Um, so it, it, it's a little bit of a mixed bag, but to the extent um, we know that, that some of the wetland properties are continuing to function, oftentimes okay. we can do those sorts of restorations. Thank you very much. Before you go on, it, it, I guess it, it would be my guess, not, not knowing anything about where the 35% came from, but a lot of that's probably development, like in Burlington, St. Albans, any of the places that are in areas that look like they probably were wetlands, it was probably filled in and converted to development? Yes, I, I think that that's a safe bet. Um, I think there's also, we know that there's a considerable amount of agriculture that takes place on, on former wetland areas too, but you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, humans are pretty industrious in terms of <laughs> uh, rendering the landscape to their liking. Yeah, John. Uh, <laughs> um, the next slide talks a little bit about presumed jurisdictional wetlands. So any wetland shown on the Vermont Significant Wetland Inventory or VSWI map is jurisdictional. But then in addition to that, wetlands that are contiguous or connected to a mapped wetland, um, as well as wetlands that are the same size and type as uh, mapped wetlands are also considered jurisdictional, along with things that are adjacent uh, to a stream, river, lake, or pond, some vernal pools, and we have some special and unique wetlands like bogs or fence that are also um, subject to our regulatory jurisdiction. 
all of that said, last session we had come to the General Assembly uh, with a, a proposal to um, a suite, a proposed suite of amendments that we, we were seeking to increase the clarity and consistency of the permitting process. Certainly the, the feedback we received from the regulated community is that our wetland rules at times can feel subjective and we're looking to get to a place um, with a, a more objective definition of a wetland based on physical characteristics, specifically size, um, as well as clearly defining the activities that would trigger permitting jurisdiction. So dredging, draining, filling, cutting. Um, so would this include some kind of delineation? Because that's one of the things I hear from constituents is how am I supposed to know what's a wetland should the state have a map with delineation so that I have an idea if I'm near a wetland? So we have an advisory layer um, that provides that sort of information. It is Im imperfect, partly because wetlands um, change over time. They are not a static feature on the landscape, but depending on changes uphill and downhill from the wetland can alter the hydrology on a particular site. Um, so it, it's challenging to produce a map that gives um, an absolute answer to landowners, recognizing fully that's what they would like. Um, there is work being done by our wetlands program. We have a pilot project in the Missisquoi watershed, um, trying to take advantage of, of higher resolution data, LIDAR data, that's mm -hmm. now available um, throughout the state to see if that helps us produce a higher quality map that would be a better, um, better value to landowners who are looking to understand where wetland resources may exist on their property. Um, ultimately, we, we encourage people that went in doubt to, to please call, mm -hmm. and we'll be happy to, to help provide um, site-specific guidance and information. Because if we're identifying stuff based on hydric soil, I would guess that there's a lot of hydric soils that have been in agriculture for a lot of years in the state of Vermont. There's just a lot of hydric soils right. in the state exactly. of Vermont. <laughs> Yeah, my point. Thank Absolutely. You. <laughs> Thank you. I think that answered my question. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, so as you probably know, the wetlands bill last session spent most of its time in the Senate Agriculture Committee, and the committee's focus was really on exemptions for various agricultural activities. Um, in the end, the, back. So oh, the oh. wetlands conversation happened in the Agriculture Committee. It started in the Agriculture Can you tell me why? Well, because the agricultural yeah. definition is, is one of the areas that could use some clarity. Okay. Agricultural definition of a wetland. Right. As I mean. opposed to the, what's the other definition? Well, so, so our, current, that's what I was going to our, our current statutory definition Please. of wetlands yeah. says, uh, creates an exemption within the definition for um, areas being used to grow food or crops in conjunction okay. with farming. Um, so one of the changes was to move to a scientifically based definition of wetland uh, consistent with the Army Corps of Engineers. And so that obviously has direct implications then for agriculture. Um, ultimately, the, the changes we uh, discussed much of the last session in the Ag Committee were, were not voted out, um, but H525, which became conveniently Act 64 of 2019, not to be confused with Act 64 of 2015, um, did include uh, several provisions related to wetlands. Um, it has us doing work to look up, look at standing up um, wetland scientist licensure requirements, which would be a step towards self-certification so that we, we aren't the only ones who can go out in the field and verify wetland boundaries. It did establish a $200 maximum permit fee for a suite of water quality improvement projects. Um, and a $5,000 cap on the fee for permanent structures used for farming, so barns most notably, but also manure pits. Um, it created a legislative study committee on wetlands, which I know uh, members of this committee participated in, and directed the Ag Agency to revise the required agricultural practices. Um, the le legislative study committee did uh, submit a, re a report that addressed four issues. Um, and ultimately recommended no legislative action to be taken at this time, um, while a, the Ag Agency continues their work um, to revise the RIPs to address farming activities and wetlands, and also um, the Agency of Natural Resources has a wetland stakeholder advisory group that we'll continue to, to meet with and flesh out um, the changes that have been discussed um, to increase clarity and consistency in the permitting process. So both of those pieces are, are moving along right now. Um, so maybe you can switch gears then and talk about stormwater, or if you would like to ask wetlands questions, Hannah and I can endeavor to answer them. 
I, I think the last thing you made it work. I mean, what is, uh, is something we'll have to come back to. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, I think unless there's any sort of brief questions, we should move on to keep on covering our terrain. Okay. Uh, stormwater it is. <laughs> so, as you may or may not be aware, there are about 60,000 acres statewide of impervious or hard surfaces. So that's roads, rooftops, parking lots, um, anything that where any place where water can't soak into the ground. And currently, less than 10% of those 60,000 acres are under some sort of regulatory requirements from the Agency of Natural Resources. So a relatively small subset. Um, if you look at the sources of phosphorus in the Vermont portion of the Champlain Basin, you can see that about 20% of them are really associated with those impervious surfaces. So developed lands, paved roads, and unpaved roads. And the Lake Champlain TMDL requires that from those, those reddish wedges of the pie, that 20%, that we achieve a 21% reduction. So we have a number of tools in our toolbox to go about achieving that 21% reduction from developed lands. These include the Municipal Roads General Permit that Emily spoke about as part of her presentation, the MS4 or Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System General Permit that's issued to our, our larger communities, mostly in Chittenden County, but then also um, St. Albans and Rutland. A TS4 general permit, which is issued to the Agency of Transportation and covers stormwater runoff from state highways, and then the three acre general permit, which we are uh, in the throes of working on right now. Can I ask just a question to make sure I'm keeping it up here? The impervious surface slide, so there's 60,000 acres of impervious surface, that's about 1% of our land area, I think. And so then 10% of that, so one tenth of 1% is regulated currently. And then if I go to the pie chart on the next page, so then we're looking at in that one tenth of one percent that's regulated. The, no, that that well, would be the whole ten. It would be the whole percent. That's the whole ten percent. Okay. Or the whole percent, right? The whole percent. Sixty thousand acres is one percent of our landscape, and that's an important point. So we we have a relatively modest amount of developed land in Vermont, but it disproportionately contributes phosphorus. Right. So that's why I can say not there's not much of it, but it's highly impactful. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so when we're talking about three acre sites, uh, there are two sort of big categories. Uh, one is a single tract, so a single landowner with greater than three acres of impervious surface that hasn't had a stormwater permit from us before. The other group is projects that may have had a stormwater permit from us before, but the permit was issued prior to 2002. And 2002 is what we sort of think of as the, the um, modern age of stormwater regulation. So prior to 2002, it was a lot about catch basins and pipes. Now it's actually about treatment. Um, and so that's an important piece. We have estimated that statewide, we think there are about Treatment of the stormwater, of the stormwater as opposed so to just moving. Just move it, yep. um, we believe that statewide, there are about a thousand of sites that would fall under this three acre definition. Um, and about half of those already have some permit from us, but that would, would date back to prior to 2002. As part of drafting um, the general permit, when we released it for public comment this fall, we did send a letter directly to those landowners um, outlining what the requirements of the general permit was, the fact that we believed, based on our own evaluation, it applied to their site, and encouraging them to take a look. Uh, and we can talk in a minute about the amount of comments we received. Right, I was ask. They sure did. Yeah. <laughs> um, what the three acre permit will require is uh, that folks achieve a level of treatment consistent with the 2017 stormwater manual and what we call our redevelopment standard, which means they have to treat um, stormwater from half the site. A new site would have to treat the entirety of the site. When we're talking about these redevelopment or retrofit projects, we, we scale that back, recognizing that there are likely to be inherent challenges. Um, we also have an engineering feasibility test that we put these projects through, and specifically landowners do not need to purchase additional land, they don't need to pump stormwater, and they don't need to construct in floodplains or wetlands. Essentially, they don't need to get another permit from the agency to, to comply with their stormwater permit. 
And if they're unable to meet the, the retrofit standards on their site, there is an opportunity to pay offsets or impact fees. Um, those impact fees, though, are only available if you can't build the project on your site. The TMDL pollution budget assumes we are going to get so many pounds of reduction associated with stormwater treatment. And so just letting folks um, into the impact fee bucket doesn't actually reduce pollution directly. So I think that's an important piece to keep in mind. Um, and the impact fees will vary depending on where you are in the state and whether you are in a stormwater impaired watershed in addition to being in a phosphorus impaired watershed between uh, $12,500 $12, an acre to $25,000 an acre. So the public comment process for the draft permit closed back on December 2nd. Uh, we received many, many sets of comments. Um, Patrick and his team are working to develop a, or finalize the responsiveness summary. Um, and we believe we remain on track to issue the final general permit by the end of March. Um, if we talk, if just thinking high level, the two big buckets, um, I would put the comments we received on the general permit into were the, the schedule. Um, how quickly folks are going to be asked to comply, and then what kind of funding or financial assistance the state will make available to support implementation. Um, we are actively working on a, a funding plan that will, we anticipate will include a mix of grants and subsidized loans, um, and we'll have that available before any applications are required. Is it traditional for us when we build out a permit to also a new permit or change of permit requirement to uh, bring money along with it for implementation, which has been our historical practice. Uh, I, I think it depends. Um, certainly when we've been doing work, for example, related to the municipal roads general permit in parallel or in conjunction with that, we stood up the municipal roads grant and aid program um, to provide financial assistance to municipalities in complying with that permit. Um, we often offer incentives for, for early adopters, people who are willing to, to take action sooner than they're required to because it, it has such, such benefits for us. Um, this is a fairly significant change in public policy. These are sites that, that have been told for the, the last 20 years of stormwater regulations that they, they're grandfathered, they don't have any requirements. Um, nothing has changed on their site, which is a usual trigger to bring people into our regulatory universe. Um, it's simply that public policy has changed. So there's in some ways a rather unique set of circumstances here. Um, and we think it's important to have a, a financial assistance program to support the, the pollution reduction targets that, that we all want to achieve. Okay. Um, can you remind us of how much money we put out to help support the municipal roads general permits? Um, it's been increasing every year. This year, I believe, uh, and by this year, I mean FY21, I believe our proposed budget includes $4.2 million. And, uh, all right, well, so that's... Um, and do you have a sense of scale of what you might propose for the three-acre supports funding? So we're looking at, it's, it's a little bit of a different animal. The Municipal Roads Grant and Aid Program is truly a grant program. Um, this, the, the financial package we're, we're putting together related to the three acre permit includes both um, loans and then some amount of loan forgiveness, which would be the moral equivalent of a, a grant program. Um, we, we don't have a, a dollar figure yet. Um, it, it's looking at how we can take advantage of, of some of our state revolving fund dollars and make those available to support this work, um, but should have those answers in the, the next few weeks. Um, I'm just trying to think, what, what will the impact be on our other water quality work if we provide more funding? Are we going to have to step back on something else, or these are complementary funding streams? Well, so the, um, the FY21 clean water budget included a fairly significant increase by virtue, should back from FY19 to FY20, it's, it's essentially level funding. And really, the big change that occurred in the clean water budget was we transitioned from a significant amount of capital dollars to sort of a 50-50 split between capital um, and general fund, more flexible general fund dollars. From FY20 to FY21, we're going from four points on the rooms and meals tax to six. And we will see a full year of the unclaimed bottle deposits, the escheats. 
the combined effect of those is actually to grow clean water funding um, by between four and six million dollars, depending on how those accounts perform. Um, we, re we program some of that increase um, in funding into actually supporting implementation of the three acre stormwater permit. So we have about $3 million in the FY21 budget that would go to support this work. Um, we are imagining that, that that's probably, um, probably plus or minus 50%. That's about the level of support that the Clean Water Fund can provide. That's why we are looking at using our state revolving fund program to, to leverage um, those dollars and make more resources available, recognizing that the stormwater work is, is relatively front loaded. It'll take place over the, the next eight to 10 years. Um, the implementation will, and then it's really an operating function after that. Um, there's a bill on our wall that talks about um, delaying implementation because although people have been hearing about it, uh, there's nothing like the specter of actually happening that, uh, and well, the rule's not final, right? So there are people who are worried about, will they be able to uh, apply in time, et cetera. So can you talk about timing? And are you contemplating asking, is there any need for the legislature, if we were to say that makes sense, that we need to change the uh, statute in order to provide more time? Or what are you thinking on timing? So that, that is absolutely one of the areas where we receive the most significant amount of comments and concerns. Um, we have also commitments that are both contained in Act 64 of 2015, as well as that we made to, to EPA in our, our um, phase one implementation plan, both of which require that all of these three acre sites obtain permit coverage by 2023. Um, and so we're trying to, to design a framework that recognizes um, the need to provide landowners with time, that there's finite capacity within the engineering community to actually do the design work, um, and at the same time being true to those goals. Um, we, it, it is a little bit of a, not even a little bit, it is a work in progress right now, um, but it, it's something where we don't believe from where we sit currently that we would, it would require a statutory change. We think that we have flexibility within the existing framework um, that allows us to, to remain consistent with achieving that ultimate goal. Um, and is it in the end that EPA will be evaluating the implementation, right? Uh, so is it from your point of view, have you tested this with them and said, uh, here are the whole suite of practices, here's a police that's lagging, but we're working on it. And you're getting feedback from Boston that says, you're, you're fine, keep going, or how does that I, I think we've gotten feedback at the 30,000 foot level that, that what, we're, what we're talking about is acceptable to them. Um, certainly the devil is in the, the details, and, and once we have a, a a full outline of our proposed approach, we'll, we'll need to cycle back with them. But that, that's clearly front of mind, um, is to, to remain consistent with the commitments we've made to EPA. Mr. McDonald? Um, you took, there's money that came out of the uh, rooms and meals mm -hmm. on this, which obviously isn't going to where it used to go. Mm -hmm. um, Secretary and I are just exchanging notes about the new New Jersey, which is between Millbury and St. Albans. Um, is that what you called it? No, he did. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to represent the new New Jersey Shrine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. At the same time, um, this winter has been, have been an unusual number of complaints about road crews throughout the state of Vermont and their real inability and you know, lack of professionalism and, uh, and not and not as good as their predecessors back when the roads used to freeze in the first of December and stay frozen like asphalt and cement until mud season, yep. and which was an affordable way to maintain roads throughout the, the state. Um, that's no longer the case today and um, because of the, the climate change issues. And, yep. um, and yet, we always seem to, everything is done without any new monies. And, um, how will we? The, how do we take care of this with, with um, as if the climate issues were not taking place? And we're, we sit here and make decisions with, you know, do what you think's best, but no new money. Um, and we've got the federal government that may tomorrow declare us all, give us all passive grades. And um, 
on our uh, on our water quality. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that we are not tackling the climate issues in a way that are, is sustainable, and we're pretending that that we can just keep different cookie jars going back and forth, and we can blame the road crews for not maintaining their roads, and that um, everything's going to be hunky dory. And um, you know, maybe I'm chicken little here. But, um, and I think you guys, are, you folks are doing a good job, a good job with the resources that you have, but you've been put in a box and told you can't stray out of this box to try and do solutions that tackle the problem. You have to you know, rob Peter to pay Paul in this, in this environment. And I think it's, so I, I have a sense of urgency that it's not shared by me. So may I just ask, um, that was supposed to be a question, but it was a, <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty. I'm just trying to get a sense of what project Senator McDonald would like them to be working on. Just help me out, because the box, where, where would you like to see them go? I'd, I'd like to see him look at some other states that are dealing with road issues and putting money into it. Um, you know, go back to down in Pennsylvania where they raised the gasoline tax for heaven's sakes, 10 cents a year to pay for it. Yeah. For four years, a 40 cent increase in, in, I think that would be, you know, that would, it would be, that would be a K, political chaos here in Vermont to do 40 cents in, in four years. But we've done 40 cent, four cents since uh, 2000, 2000. And we sit here and wonder why our road crews or the mm -hmm. towns are not performing. Um, we, we watch. Um, we watch what's going on, and we sit on our hands and say, uh, well, this is a big, big deal. We've got to deal with this stuff. And we are playing with cookie jars and moving things back and forth and relying on folks as skillful and nimble as, as you are and trying to make do with as we fall farther and farther behind and, um, and compliment you for doing good work with the resources that you have available. Thank you for that. That's very helpful. Well, the Finance Committee could find new revenues. Not unless this committee and other committees give us boot in the backside. Not unless the governor says, um, you know, we have a problem for us, that climate change is an economic problem. It's going to cost us a lot of money. Um, you know, the Finance Committee can, you know, tack up hill against the machine gun any time it wants to, and then you'll have a new Finance Committee. It is an amazing committee, but we can't do it all. Yeah, well, well three, three years well. running, we had a per parcel thing. Remember, it kept coming. We would send it out as a way of yes. finding, so, finding revenue. It was never very popular. Oh, of course, no, no, no revenue was pop popular, and that's because there's a lot of Vermonters that are stretched to the limit and already can't keep up with the bills they have, and so how do you make them pay more? And you would regress I, it with a per parcel tax. Right. And yeah. I put an alternative for climate change on the ball, everybody should be responsible for their own carbon. Okay, that's okay. always so, willing to help with alternatives. Uh, and I appreciate I am so helpful. I appreciate that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying you've given me this quote. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the stress from sitting there, you. My forest sequestered carbon from your plane trip to California. Oh, for God's sake, Can you go to Hawaii a zillion times. <laughs> Can we blame one another that the solutions are simple to personal carbon offsets? Wow, you've got a beautiful piece of now. Secretary here. It sounds like an excellent conversation for another moment. That's right, I can buy it from him. We digress. Yes, digress. Do you have anything more you want to fill us in on a three acre permit? I would look to Patrick. Any particular highlights you feel like? You covered it well. Okay. <laughs> uh, Ms. Smith, do you, is there anything, uh, you've been intimately involved with the whole wetlands question, right? Uh, so that working group still going? You know, anything more that you want to fill us in on? We're looking to reconvene at the beginning of March. Okay. Oh, the working committee? The, the state group. Oh, great. So, on a explain the serious level on three acre is we should have a check in at some point to know prior you know well prior to germany how that's unfolding and if you feel like there's we should at least be aware and yes. maybe there's uh, something corrective we ought to be thinking about 
doing in concert with you. Yes. Um, on the wetland side, the, I don't know if uh, that you're anticipating that that group's going to keep on working, the RAPs are going to keep on uh, being written, and really we won't revisit that um, for the most part until next session. That's all right. That does sound great. Yes. Um, and I, I, as I said, we're, we're working towards aggressively towards an, an end of March uh, issuance of the, the final general permit. So somewhere after town meeting, we would be in a position to come back and talk further um, about where things stand and, and if there are any changes. But as we sit today, um, we believe that we have the authorities we need to, to make the modifications to the schedule. Okay. So the, it was originally the everyone would have had to have filed by July 1 of this year? I would ask Patrick to talk about the original schedule. Um, everybody would have to be permitted by 2023. The first applications would be due. Um, draft permit had some as early as seven months out, but we're going to push that so everyone has at least 12 months. So we have to avoid having everyone apply at the same time, so we'll spread those applications out over the course of until early 2023, so everyone's permitted by later in 2023. So there's the rule we get finalized. You'll issue that your, uh, what's the issuance date for the final? So the, the rule is finalized. So what we you, have, what, what's in front of us is the general permit that implements the rule. Thank you. Yep. Um, the general permit, our goal is to have it finalized by the end of March. Okay. Um, and then as Patrick indicated, there would be at least 12 months provided for the first group to obtain coverage. And um, uh, is this, are we using that sort of tiered structure by TMDL? So um, impaired waters are going first, and then it fo follows out from there? Yes, the earliest applications were due were in the stormwater impaired waters. And then it's really just broken out by lake segment um, to a few different groups. So if uh, the general comes out in March, is it your sense, based on conversations you've had, that be at the engineering level and at the staff level, that you're seeing capacity to meet that late 23 uh, timeline? Yes. Okay. Um, great. Any other? So we covered a lot of territory today. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming in. And. I don't know if you or any members of your team have anything more you want to share while you're here. Um, schedule follow-up on more particular issues. Um, I do have, since we are running a little ahead miraculously, um, the, the uh, I do want to check back in at Lake Carmine. I know that was, so that was, you know, I think if someone said, well, what was that? And I said, well, it was kind of like assembling the SWAT team. Like everything we could think of was, sort of formed around looking at how to address Lake Carmine. Can you give us a brief Lake Carmine update? I know I didn't ask you to be prepared to do that. Uh, I will, yep, and then I can get you some additional information that will probably have more details that I'm capable of recalling. But um, so was, we did work uh, aggressively through the spring and early summer of this past year to install an aeration system in Lake Carmine. Um, it's a, a, a lake-wide system. It's one of the largest aeration systems that has been installed in the country. And the theory behind the aeration was um, we know a lot of the phosphorus that's actually in the implementation. We didn't turn the system on quite as early as we would have liked to, which did allow some phosphorus to become um, mobilized into the water column. And then also had just some mechanical issues, frankly, with this complicated system um, that caused the system to be taken offline at a couple different points during the summer. Um, we've collected an inordinate amount of data um, to, to test sort of the hypotheses we have that keeping oxygen at that sediment water interface should keep the total um, phosphorus in the water column at a lower level. Um, the data seems to support that when the system is working, that that is indeed the case. Um, we know that there was a significant algae bloom this fall um, on Lake Carmine. And you know, the conventional wisdom would be it would have been worse but for the system, but that's a, a hard theory to prove. Um, and we're looking forward to, to having another year of operations um, under our belt um, in, in 2020. 
again, collecting really robust monitoring data, but believe we've worked the kinks out of the system, can turn the system on as early as, as we believe is necessary to, to maintain that oxygen level at the sediment water interface, um, and hopeful that we'll see even more significant improvements in terms of algal blooms. Just from on the ground, um, I do think most people saw that it, they feel at least it, you know, anecdotally on the ground that the blooms happened so much later where they, yeah. the, the situation we had in Lake Champlain, you know, St. Albans Bay was blooming late, you know, early July, right. where, you know, Lake Carmine didn't until later in the year. So there is um, reason for optimism there. But one of the concerns locally was, is that the um, cost to run the thing is a lot more expensive than they anticipated. Um, the electrical costs are very, very expensive to run um, the two generators constantly. Yeah, no, we, we certainly heard that as well um, and are, are looking at ways to sort of optimize the performance of those systems. Is any more phosphorus going into the, into, into the lake? at all. Yeah, so the goal is never zero, right? Uh, right. For Lake Carmine, we also have a, a very specific pollution budget, and I think it targeted, and maybe Ryan can correct me if I'm wrong, but a 40% reduction from the watershed into Lake Carmine, um, and we've achieved that reduction based on the, the BMPs that have been deployed related to agriculture and road runoff and stormwater management. There are no wastewater sources in that watershed. So we believe we achieved the, the reductions. Um, and that's why we were confident in moving ahead with the, the aeration system. So the, many of those practices require maintenance in order to sustain the sort of reductions that, that they have achieved, um, and that's an ongoing book of work. Um, both. May I ask, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry to uh, why 40%? So when, when we build these TMDLs or pollution budgets, what we're looking at is the, the water quality standard, whatever the allowable concentration of phosphorus is and the volume of water in the lake. Um, and we come up with essentially an estimate of how much phosphorus the lake can have without having an, an adverse effect from, from, in this instance, phosphorus pollution. Um, and then essentially it's just a math problem where we're calculating what the current load is, where we've measured um, incoming phosphorus contributions to Lake Carmine, and the maximum amount we believe the lake could actually sustain without having an, uh, an algal bloom or an adverse effect. So yes, so it's still going in, but just not as much. Correct. We, okay. We've done a lot of work in the watershed to sort of turn back the turn spigot. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we believe that the, the amount currently being delivered to the lake, the lake should be able to sustain. The complicating factor is there's a lot of uh, legacy phosphorus sitting on the bottom of the lake. Um, and so to the extent the loads coming in from the tributaries have been reduced, it appears that the, it's essentially that load gets made up by releases from the bottom sediments, and so we're hopeful the aeration system will will take care of that portion of the load ultimately as well. And they just ask, where does the, who decided on the forty percent? It's just through the formula you put in things. And yeah, it's a it's a it's, it's, a, it's a combination of modeled and monitored data. There's a team within the Department of Environmental Conservation that runs a suite of water quality models, um, and then ultimately EPA needs to approve that pollution budget is, is being an accurate reflection of conditions on the ground. Thank you. So if the aeration system works and keeping the phosphorus locked up, we always have legacy phosphorus. So we have to run the aeration system for the rest of the time? No. So as I indicated in my earlier remarks, uh, there's a certain amount of erosion and sedimentation that's occurring naturally in all of these systems. Yes. Um, by virtue of the conservation measures we've deployed throughout the developed land and agricultural communities, the new sediments arriving in Lake Carmi should be relatively phosphorus poor compared to the legacy sediments sitting on the bottom of the lake. And so the, the thinking is ultimately we're going to bury that phosphorus essentially with cleaner sediment. And of course humans exacerbate all of these problems, but that's one of the things that I think is under uh, realized in this building is that nutrification and sedimentation is a natural process and some of our older lakes and ponds are filled with nutrients even before humans started disrupting so much right. stuff. Eutrophication is absolutely a natural process. It's the rate that yeah, we, we that tend we to turn affect. Off. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, what are the lessons that are, is it 
too early to say what the lessons are that we're learning from Lake Carmine, how they might be applied more broadly to our phosphorus challenge. I, I do think it's it's probably too early. Um, I, I think it, it speaks to the importance that in lake treatments may have um, and just while we need to do essential work throughout the watershed, whether it's the three acre permit, the required agricultural practices, etc. Um, but ultimately, in order to sort of have the desired outcomes that Vermonters want in terms of whoever it said, fewer beach closures and, and fewer algal blooms, we may have to have an in-lake component to our treatment. Um, and we have ongoing books of work in St. Albans Bay, um, working with the Army Corps of Engineers and Lake Champlain Basin program to look at internal loading, again, the, the material phosphorus that's being released both from the Black Creek Swamp as well as the bottom sediments. Um, and then a new project, with, again, with the Lake Champlain Basin Program, looking at the, the river deltas in Missisquoi Bay, where, where those richer sediments have accumulated to see if there's some, some spot or targeted treatments we can deploy. So as we are successful in what we believe is the work required in the watershed to then be able to turn our attention to, to controlling in lake sources as well. Because, I mean, you'd see in like Fairfield Pond, I think their whole issue actually is just in pond sediment, they actually don't have that many nutrient sources right there. Right, and so, it, and it's different for, for each water body, and I think the challenge is trying to figure out what the right timing is for an in-lake treatment, so that, that that's a wise investment of resources, that we've done the work necessary to make sure we're not just um, continuing to load or receiving water and, and applying what would effectively then be a band-aid um, within the lake, that we've done the hard work on the watershed and then can provide treatment in the lake that's really meaningful. We still or are you still considering using things like alum? So it, that has some application. Um, we had a very successful application, probably the better part of 30 years ago now, down on Lake Moray. Although we've started to see more recent breakthroughs in the the alum treatment we apply down there. Um, there was a treatment in Tickle Naked Pond in Rygate, I think, and there was a fairly catastrophic event in the watershed that it resulted in a large nutrient release and it, it overwhelmed um, the alum treatment that had been applied there in a matter of, of years. Um, it's something that's being looked at in St. Albans Bay, but I think there are concerns about the <coughs> fetch and the way the wind and wave action might move that material around. Um, so there, it, it's another tool in the toolbox. Aeration, we believe, is probably a tool in the toolbox, and it's trying to figure out what the right combination is for the sort of site-specific conditions in different parts of the lake and different inland lakes and ponds. Didn't you hear testimony that alum causes dementia also, and there's some serious side effects of using it, I thought we heard a couple years ago. But, yeah. I'm not sure. I don't remember that yeah. in particular, but uh, you know, in time we start applying lots of things that aren't usually there. Right. It's a concern. Right. No matter what, yes. how natural or not how unnatural the things are. Second Rogers. Um, have you, uh, I've been learning some, I want to learn more about biochar. Mm -hmm. um, and from what I understand, it has an ability to lock some of that stuff up. Have you guys been doing any projects with biochar? So we have. Um, probably the. So biochar the is uh, wood that's burned under low oxygen pyrolysis. Um, and what it makes is like a charcoal looking substance. Right. It's wood that's Sorry. not, that's partially burned, but not really burned. Yeah. And it has the ability to act like a sponge to suck up nutrients. Yes. Yeah. It has a lot of surface area, just mm -hmm. by virtue and, of that process. And can also, is huge in store in carbon mm -hmm. and can last for thousands of years once it's put into the soil mm -hmm. as, as locked up carbon. So the uh, administration's been doing work under what we call the Phosphorus Innovation Challenge, which is sort of a joint initiative of ANR Agriculture and the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Um, and it was looking at innovative strategies for addressing phosphorus pollution. And there was um, a, green, a Green State Biochar was mm -hmm. one of the um, award recipients under the, the Phosphorus Innovation Challenge. And they had um, installed a couple of different filter systems and we're going through the process with them now at looking at what it would take to bring that to scale and, and if there's actually sort of market opportunities with it that would allow that to stand up um, and be a cost-effective treatment practice on that's its own. That's great to hear because what I understand is that the thought process is that you can actually make like big 
combatants or whatever with biochar in them, and it will act like a sponge in places that have too much phosphorus and can actually possibly absorb and hold a lot of it, and then it could it would have value to put it back into land somewhere that needed phosphorus, but would also lock up all that carbon and improve the soil. So, and that's that's the they're sort of working uh, with folks from from the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund on a business case right now to see if that all kind of pencils can out. Can work out. Yeah. Right. Right. Interesting. One other phosphorus challenge project I think was there were it was going to be a methane digester with phosphorus removal as part of the technology. Yeah. I think it was yes. like three or four farms and they were kept being short one farm up your, your way their parent. Do you know if that has moved forward? Or, um, so the community digester in St. Albans hasn't moved forward. That was a Green Mountain Power project. Uh, that said, the Phosphorus Innovation Challenge is, is partnered with a digester um, on a farm in Addison County. And the, the pilot project um, used a technology called dissolved air flotation uh, to capture the finest particles out of this manure stream um, and was able to show that using dissolved air flotation after digestion, after anaerobic digestion, they could reduce phosphorus concentrations in the manure by as much as 80%. Um, now they're in the process of looking at can they create a, a potting soil mix using those fines removed from the, the manure um, that Kat, has, has real market value. Kat McKeon's son has a business that... He takes the, the larger fibers is my understanding and this is really focused on the, the smaller right. finer particles but it, I would say it's kind of theme and variation in that space. Right. Um, is and I, Goodrich Farm? It, it isn't. This is on the Audet Blue Spruce Farm um, in Bridport. And I think the challenge has been they're very successful at capturing these finds, but as they dry, it turns into something that's not unlike cement. <laughs> and so trying to figure out a way to keep them light enough that you could actually mix them into a, a potting soil mix. Um, and again, they, they've advanced through this, this first stage that they've shown. If, a, they had a grad student at UVM, my understanding, is running this material through food processors and creating <laughs> not, a, not a scalable technology. Um, but she was able to do grow tests with this and show that the, this material is, is very um, good in terms of its, its germination results and its productivity results. So it's really this matter of how do you keep it from turning into a... We always prove things on a very small scale at first. Or attempt to prove things because you don't want to build a specialized machine and then right. find out how the theory right. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so they're continuing research in that space and my understanding is have, have come up with a second process and they're currently doing grow tests on it but that's another one that shows real promise um, and the third one the third one that shows real promise is a sort of hub and spokes composting system model um, that there was work done at the Foster Brothers uh, Vermont Ag Products facility in Middlebury looking at accelerating the rate of comp um, composting by changes in airflow and heat and I can't claim to understand the full details and then now there's there's work being done to look at um, could you create sort of a Foster Brothers North somewhere in Franklin County again with that hub and spokes model where you have a centralized compost facility that is is bringing in material um, from farmers in the area. And that's another one that there's business case work being done on right now to, to see if that, that would pencil out as well. Well, thank you for a um, great testimony. A, a very helpful update. On You're the welcome. Water quality work. Thank you. My pleasure. And to thank, your, you. thank you. Team as well. So, you Patrick, thanks for coming. Thank you. So we are adjourned. Thank you.